Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you all uh, to the Rot Institute of Natural Science. And I'm, I'm going to read this, if you don't mind, so I don't forget things. But thank you for coming today, and welcome to the Vins Nature Center. And I think you'll admit it's one of the most extraordinary places that you could ever visit. So, and I hope some of you got here early enough to go down and walk on the forest canopy walk. Yes. Yes. All right. It is fitting that we are having this conversation today in this place and at this time. Founded in 1972 as a nonprofit environmental education organization with a mission of motivating individuals and communities to care for the environment through education, research, and avian wildlife rehabilitation, VINS is an important force for environmental stewardship. Over the past 50 years, and by the way, this is our 50th anniversary this year. <laughs> we've been through several iterations and rose occasionally from the ashes of adverse events. Uh, through this time, VINS has become a world-class environmental education organization and a sought-after destination for residents and visitors to the Vermont and uh, to Vermont and the Upper Valley. I'm pleased to welcome you to VINS and participation in this important discussion centered around the action required to mitigate the effects of climate change. The format for today is a question and answer session, and you'll be invited to ask the panel specific questions for them to answer. And we have a method. We'll go out with a microphone. You'll be able to ask that question. So um, the portion of the event will begin uh, after uh, I introduce our panel and ask the first question. And then you'll raise your hand and we'll bring the mic around. We'll have about 30 minutes of questions, and then each panel member will have closing remarks. <laughs> so while you know everybody, I'm going to introduce them anyway. <laughs> Peter Welch. Congressman Welch has represented Vermont in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2007. In an era of partisanship, he is widely recognized as a skilled legislator who chooses governing over gridlock. A progressive leader, Peter has been on the front lines of the fight to lower the cost of pre prescription drugs, protect our planet while creating good union jobs, expand broadband in rural America, and expand and protect voting rights. And I'm also told that uh, Peter is running for the United States Senate. <laughs> So I've uh, mispronounced uh, Becca's uh, last name from the beginning. So I think it's Ballant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the senator was the first woman to serve as the Vermont Senate President Pro Tem. She was first elected to the Vermont State Senate in 2014. And she has brought many successes as majority leader, including shoring up votes to pass the largest Vermont housing bond in decades. She's worked successfully to pass minimum wage increase for thousands of Vermont low-wage workers, uh, something that's important to us at VINS uh, as well. And uh, I'd like to say we were a bit progressive and maybe raised our rates before this, but that would not be true. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we were, uh, we were pleased to follow that, uh, so thank you for doing that. Uh, she's also led the su successful flight fight for the most progressive reproductive freedom legislation in the nation. And she's working and has worked uh, behind the scenes and in the forefront to pass one of the boldest climate justice bills uh, that's been passed in the state of Vermont to date. <laughs> and she is running for the United States House of Representatives. <laughs> Uh, 
Bill, Bill McGibbon. So Professor McGibbon serves as the Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has won the Gandhi Peace Prize given annually by the government of India. He has received honorary degrees from over 20 colleges and universities. I mean, that's amazing, really. Um, you may know of his book, uh, 1989, called The End of Nature, really regarded as the first uh, book for a general audience that spoke about the looming climate change crisis. And that book has been published in 24 languages. That's just, just amazing. <laughs> his argument that the survival of the globe is dependent on a fundamental philosophical shift in the way we relate to nature is more relevant today than perhaps ever. Thank you, Bill. So I'm seeing a lot of old friends here, and I'm very appreciative that you're all here, and new friends as well, so thank you for that. So the question and answer is actually going to start with a question that I have. So I'll read this, and then we'll proceed. This is the decisive decade for the world to confront climate change and avoid the worst irreversible impacts of this crisis. The President has called on Congress to act on climate, and Congress has responded by passing the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. So the question is, how will the climate provisions in these laws work to achieve these stated goals? And these are goals that the White House has set. Reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels by 2030, reaching 100 percent carbon pollution-free electricity by 2035, achieving a net zero emissions economy by 2050, and delivering 40 percent of the benefits from federal investment in climate and clean energy to disadvantages, disadvantaged communities. So who wants to begin? But I think Congressman. Well, should begin. <laughs> you know, here's the significance. And Bill is going to talk about this, but his, his book in 1989 followed testimony uh, in 1988. It was James, or Jim Hansen, who testified to Congress about the glooming uh, reality of, the, of, of climate change. And uh, Bill, when I was talking to him earlier, said it took Congress 34 years and 50 days to respond <laughs> to uh, his testimony in your book. And that's literally true. And I've been in Congress for 16 years and been through what has dismayed all of us, which is climate denial in the face of how it is in our face. And we saw how disastrous it was. And the biggest challenge initially, we thought, was climate denial, denial of science. Frankly, that was more an excuse than the real argument. The real argument, the real motivator was fear, fear of making that transition and whether we would be able to do it in a, successfully, where we'd get to a clean energy economy that was affordable. The only way you can do that is with, number one, public policy that supports clean energy, supports retrofitting homes, supports electric vehicles. When you get the public policy, then you can have the market dynamics get into action and really accelerate it and create an inevitable and unrelenting and unstoppable force in a new direction. Any of you read the New York Times today saw a front page article about the billions and billions of dollars that are now being invested by corporate America into clean energy. So the real significance of this, because I don't have the answers, none of us do to each of these questions, how is it going to be done? The real significance of what Congress finally, finally did is that there is now public policy 
that supports clean energy entrepreneurship, supports investing in clean energy. And that is what has been the game changer. You know, we've got everything from a battery a facility right here in Vermont, uh, up in Waterbury, where folks who are blue collar workers are getting really good jobs. That's what has to happen. So that's what I think and believe is so significant about the Inflation Reduction Act and the $370 billion that's going into making clean energy affordable. So I was talking with Bill when we, we first got here, and I said one of the things that was very inspiring to me is he, he had an article in Common Dreams in the last week that he wrote with some younger folks. And it really spoke to this issue of, it's not just about the policy. We have to pass good policy. We have to hold people accountable for passing good policy. And then we have to implement it in a way that works not just in uh, places like Chicago and in Miami. It has to work here in rural Vermont. And I know that's something that I care a lot about and the other two gentlemen up here with me care a lot about too. For me, the significance of the Inflation Reduction Act and all of the pieces that are related to uh, climate change action and resiliency is that it is giving younger people hope that we're actually going to do something. Mm -hmm. And that, I can't overstate how important that is. And I saw it also with Congress finally, after 25 years, passing uh, gun safety measures. After 25 years. And yes, they were modest. But you know what? It was signaling that this is a change that is going to be made, made and that is a down payment on what we need to do in the future. And I see the same thing for the Inflation Reduction Act. When I travel across Vermont, what I hear is a lot of despondency about the state of the world, and specifically from young people, about climate change. And they feel like they do not know where to put their energy. They do not know if it's even worth engaging in the political process. And that, for me, to be able to say to my, I have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, be able to say to them, action is happening, there's more to do, but you have to still believe in the democracy or else it, it is lost. And so um, we can talk more about the details, but for me, that was the most significant piece. Um, and I don't want it to be lost on all of us. <laughs> Absolutely, Becky. I think what you're saying is just right. And this, uh, you know, the passage of this bill does bring back lots of memories. I remember 2006, and there were some people uh, who are here today, who were on that first march we did up the western edge of Vermont uh, that turned really into the first big climate demonstration in the U.S. We walked for five days up to Burlington, and we met, among other things, uh, 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 a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, Peter Welch, who met us down by the lake and uh, put his John Hancock on the, the big poster board that we had up there saying he would work to cut emissions 80%, uh, which at the time was a very radical idea. And there was uh, also running for office Senator Sanders and signed. And the Vermonters have been at the lead in this work all the way along, and we're extraordinarily grateful for it. Now, the work uh, is doesn't even begin to stop here. Um, this was, this was, uh, this was this bill was not the way that you might perhaps have most rationally gone about doing all this. Uh, Senator Manchin took out the parts that would have forced utilities to do the right thing. Instead, there's you know put in large pots of money that hopefully will have the I think will do the work of helping spur the development now of ever cheaper renewable energy. We're at a moment where things really could begin to shift quite quickly. But they better shift quite quickly, because we're here today. I mean, it's you couldn't depict that your advance team, Peter, did a good job. This is as beautiful a day as it's possible to imagine in Vermont. <laughs> but while we're here today, in Sacramento today, it's 117 degrees. They've wow. hotter than it's ever been. Uh, in Pakistan today, the Indus River is 100 kilometers wide as it comes across the center, the heartland of Pakistan. Um, we are in desperate trouble. 
we need extraordinary work to continue. And that primary job of that continues to be the job of standing up to the fossil fuel industry that has delayed action at every turn, trying to keep its business model alive a little longer. And we need on every front to be continuing to take them on. And we can talk some more about how that'll happen. But the hope is, the hope is that at least now we're in the race. That after 34 years, the federal government has decided that the country that put more carbon into the air than any other, and by a large margin, is at least going to play some role in doing something about this. And I'll tell you one of the people who was happiest about this, I think, it's John Kerry, the US climate envoy out to the rest of the world, who's had for the last two years the very thankless task of trying to explain why the US hasn't ever done anything. And, 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 and now at least he has something to work with. So let us hope, but more than hope, let us work very, very hard to build more momentum from this point in. So uh, are there questions? OK, there's a question in the back. Uh, yeah. John, uh, we're going to have a mic, so we'll all hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I'm John Meyer from Norwich, Vermont. And um, all three of you have wonderful track records of action uh, to try to uh, get us to where we are now on climate change. And the recent legislation passed is hopeful. I'd like to ask each one of you to tell us what your top priority would be to mitigate climate change and how that could be done in the near future, how, how that priority could help us in the near future rather than waiting till 2050 or beyond. If you could be specific, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Carbon emissions come from many, many different sources, from our homes, from driving, uh, from farming, uh, from every imaginable source. We have to have energy, and it's based on fossil fuels. So the question that you're asking presumes that you can afford to pick one thing when you actually have to be doing everything you can on every single thing. You have to be doing every single thing you can. By the way, that's somewhat empowering, so if you're a homeowner, the legislation that uh, your former student, Andrew Savage, inspired, the Hope for Homes Act, provides incentives for us to be able to retrofit our homes and, uh, and, and make them uh, tighter. Uh, electric vehicles, you know, which is a big deal. We've got to make those affordable. So it's an option for somebody who really needs to drive a pickup truck. They've got to be able to get an F-150 that's affordable. Well, that means you've got to have a plentiful uh, charging stations so that there's security that when you're going from here to there and you need a fill up you're going to be able to do it so you know my view here is that it's not just picking a priority it's picking a goal and getting to it and the most carbon reductions we can get as soon as we can get them is what's going to get us there so the, the two things that I am doing the most personal research on. So I'm in this mode of I've won the primary, haven't won the general, have to prepare to have this job that I don't have yet, but it's really important that I prepare. And so I have been trying to learn as much as I possibly can about how we end fossil fuel subsidies, like permanently. For, I mean, this is right. This is what we need to do. And I just read um, last night I was doing a little um, a little fun nighttime reading. My understanding is in the last year, uh, we've had the most tax credits globally going to fossil fuel companies ever. And so that for me is where I would like to put my attention. The other thing that I'm trying to come up to speed on is how do we make it possible for the grid to really uh, be able to deliver on the amount of electrification that we're going to require over the next 10 to 15 and 20 years. So those are the two things that I am doing a deep dive on and would welcome input from all of you because it's not my area of expertise, but I know I've got to come up to speed on it. So thanks. So excellent, excellent answers both. There are two, I mean, look, 
this is the biggest problem humans have ever faced and by a very large margin. So, and our time to solve it is very, very short. It's the first problem like this we've ever had that comes with a time limit. If we don't solve it soon, we will not solve it. Winning slowly is just a different form of losing on climate change. Because once you've melted the Arctic, no one's got a good plan for how you freeze it back up again. Okay? So, so you got to look for the levers that are big enough to pull that they might actually make a big difference. So one of those, there's two of them, I think. And one of them is marked politics. And, and we've been pulling hard on it. And thank heaven we got some play out of it. And with Peter and Becca pushing in Washington, we will get more going forward. We're going to have to. The other lever is marked money or finance. And we've got to pull it hard, too. The, the four big banks in this country, Chase, Citi, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, are also the four biggest lenders in the world to the fossil fuel industry. I wrote a piece for The New Yorker a couple of years ago with the long, but I think correct title. It said, uh, money is the oxygen on which the fires of global warming burn. And if we can figure out how to staunch that flow of money, and to some degree, we've managed to do this. We've, you know, this huge divestment campaign around the world that's now at $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel, not including, it must be said, the state of Vermont's pension fund, which is a great sadness, um, but one I think that may be remediated after the next election, we shall see. But uh, uh, that's played a big role. But now we're working hard to try and take on those banks directly. I'm spending a, a lot of my time now, now that I'm old, we've started this new thing called Third Act that organizes people like me over the age of 60. One of the, re one of the campaigns we're taking on, and there's a very good Vermont chapter that's working on this, is, is this question of banks. And there was a demonstration we helped put on up in Burlington a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, outside the Chase Bank uh, office there. And of course, lots and lots of the high school kids came because they're, you know, in the lead of all of this. And they're somewhat spryer, so they were at the head of the march. But at the back, there was a, a, a big showing of, you know, people with hairlines like mine marching under a banner that said, Fossils Against Fossil Fuels. <laughs> so uh, that's the spirit that we're in now. I'm glad he's not talking about senior citizens. Uh, question. Hello. Thank you all for everything you're doing and everyone here, this important work. My name is Kathy Hassey. I live in Royalton. For the past year, I've been a volunteer with 350 Vermont. Thank you, Bill. And 350 opens our eyes a lot to greenwashing, which we probably all know is when something is made to look as if it's good for the environment and it is not. I'd like to hear from each of you how we can thwart or shut down greenwashing. A quick example, 350 taught me a couple days ago, there's a petition now with our Public Utility Commission. It involves um, Burlington Gas wanting methane from a landfill, I think it's called Seneca Lake in upstate New York, Almost none of it's really going to get to Vermont. The company concedes that. This is like some of the dirtiest energy we could have. And it's before one of our, you know, government branches. And it, it's looking like they're going to say it's okay. And that, to me, is a fraud on us. There's enough real work to do, right? We don't need to pile lies on top of it. How can we do away with greenwashing? I can... So very, very important and good question. And I'll tell you something interesting that just happened today. Uh, Miriam Webster announced that greenwashing is now actually going to be an entry in next year's dictionary. So it's reached the point where we, and, and, and one of my colleagues pointed out that this is a very good sign. It means that enough people have cottoned on to what's going on. Now, it, the, the fight against it happens in many, many different ways including big campaigns and beautiful ones that people are now running to get advertising agencies and PR firms and things to get out of the greenwashing business. I've written a good deal about this, and we've found uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of young people in these creative industries who don't want to be doing this kind of... And 
your point about natural gas is the absolute perfect example. For decades now, uh, people have been telling us that gas is the clean bridge fuel to the future, cleaner than coal, you know, on and on and on. But it turns out, well, it's we've known for many years that it's nonsense. Uh, uh, the, the, when you burn gas, you produce less carbon than when you burn coal, but you produce way you you release huge quantities of methane into the atmosphere. Methane is a very quick acting greenhouse gas molecule for molecule, a hundred times more potent than CO2 in trapping heat. And so, and truthfully, this was the place where the, the Democratic Party's been weakest over the last few decades. Republicans have been the party of coal, but Democrats have tended to be the party of natural gas. Happily, I think we're beginning to understand why that can't be anymore. And, and it's really important that we do. The easiest way to avoid greenwashing is to understand that that at the base at root now the question has become of what we need to do has become fairly simple again I wrote a long piece when I sort of figure things out I tend to write long piece for the New Yorker so I wrote a long piece <laughs> earlier this year the 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 burden of which was humans have now we've now reached the point where we can end our 200,000 year habit of setting stuff on fire um, um, it served us well back in caveman days, and then it served us sort of well during the Industrial Revolution. It made us rich, but now it's causing extraordinary problems for human health. Nine million people a year die breathing particulates from fossil fuel. It causes us huge political problems. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin can invade Ukraine because he's got a lot of oil and gas, and it's going to destroy the planet. And we do not need it anymore. Over the last 10 years, engineers have brought the cost of power from sun and wind down 90%. We live on a planet where the cheapest way to generate power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. So that should be our job now. Ending combustion and thanking the good Lord that he was kind enough to hang a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away in the sky that we now have the wit to make absolutely full use of. So anything else, any other like plan for something else that we could burn is mostly just a way to prolong the business model of people who've been in the burning business for a very long time. And there are endless permutations, you know, uh, 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 one of which you mentioned. So our job is to get past that and concentrate on clean energy that's now cheap and plentiful. The one, the one thing I would just add, because if we pull out a little bit to your question um, around greenwashing, it really is also essentially a question of misinformation. And something that I worry about a lot. And so very simply put, I really want us to take a good hard look at how we regulate big social media. So it's part of the problem. The question in the front. Hi, I'm Carl Brand, and I teach at Vermont Technical College. I started my 46 year teaching physics, and I've started teaching climate change science. And I also don't just talk about it. I have a net 1,500-ton negative carbon footprint. I run my house and car totally with solar photovoltaic and supply solar photovoltaic energy to 38 other families we raise on my land. And the question I have is, the problem I've seen is convincing people that if you take out a loan and put in panels, that it's really a negative loan. You cut down your cash flow. I've had people say, oh, I don't want a loan. And I said, well, give me the money that you're going to give to the utility. I'll give you the same electricity for half the price. Um, I'm saving about $10,000 a year, including paying for the panels for the energy that I use. I have a Tesla. I have 132,000 miles on it. Um, and we need some kind of an education program and to see if you have any ideas on how to get people to accept the fact that it's now as you said, it's the cheapest way to make electricity. It cost me one cent a mile to run my car based on the amortization of my photovoltaic panels. I think ICE cars is 25 cents a mile. You know, the, the best way 
to persuade people to do it <coughs> is to make it affordable. I mean, think about what solar panel, solar energy cost is down, what did you say, Bill, 90%? Electric vehicles, a lot of people would like to drive, uh, drive them, especially when we've been having gas at four to five bucks, but can they afford it? They've got to become affordable. They've got to become reliable. And it, the people who can save money are going to make the decision that they want to have that option. So, you know, there's really two elements to this. We've been pushing back on the lies of the fossil fuel industry. And, of course, they finance studies to make up junk science and then accuse the real science of having bogus science, right? That's what happened. And it, a lot of people, social media, like you said, Becca, reinforce that. But there's something underneath that that we also have to understand and accept politically in order to get folks to where we need to be, not just for us, but for them. If you're a coal worker in West Virginia, I went to a coal mine uh, with a colleague, a Republican colleague, and we went down in the shaft 900 feet and then four and a half miles in on one of those little cars, and I spent the afternoon with these workers. Those workers had families. Those workers did not cause climate change. Those workers are worried about putting food on the table. Those workers would be fine if they could get another good job. And that's not computer coding. Let's not kid ourselves. That's like real work that they want to do that suits them, OK? So a big part of what we have to do is acknowledge that there's a transition that occurs and it's disruptive and find ways, A, to really help those folks who, through no fault of their own, are in Kentucky or in West Virginia. And then what's really important, we got to stand up to the fossil fuel companies and what they're doing. And I think, like your divestment bill, that you've been working so hard is a big factor. But also, bottom line, we have to make it affordable for somebody, that coal worker, to have a job that pays the bills. We've got to make it affordable for some farmer here in Vermont who has to have a truck. And if he can get an electric or she can get an electric F-150 and it's going to be able to save money and do the calculation, Carl, that you just did, they're going to be bragging about it, OK? So that's really an all-in approach. But it has to include taking into account the reality for a lot of folks who had nothing to do with creating climate change and for whom, if we don't do it in the right way, are going to pay a price with their families. That's what's going to get us the political support. I'll just add one thing that I think will make this a lot easier, and there's happily some money in this new bill for it. One of the, and, and I thought of it in a way because you were talking about Vermont Tech. I mean, one of the things that we're going to need in this country in the next five years is about a million more electricians. Um, and and because, because that's not only is it necessary to do it, but having that infrastructure of people who know how to do this will make it endlessly. I cannot tell you the number of people who write me asking what heat pump they should install in their house. <laughs> this is a bad question to ask me. I, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know. But that's what, and so if in every community in Vermont there are two HVAC people who really understand how to do heat pumps, then we'll have heat pumps everywhere fast because you're absolutely right. The economic argument for them is already there very powerfully. And, and, and I will just add the, the other technology that's really cool. And I mean, the good news is all these technologies that we're talking about are better than the ones that they replace. So the EV is a better car than the car you drove before. The heat pump's better than getting the open flame out of your kitchen and replacing it with a magnetic induction cooktop turns out to be, I mean, the, 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 we have new data on this. If you, if you have, say, kids or grandkids, they're chances of them getting asthma go up 40% if they're in a house with gas stove in the kitchen. If you think about it for a minute, you'll under, you, I mean, you have an open flame in your kitchen. I mean, you're basically doing cooking the same way that people cooked 200,000 years ago, OK? So, so we're at a moment when we have lots and lots of possibilities. And if we do them right, it's going to create this virtuous circle of lots and lots of people having terrific, I, I tweeted out the other day, 
uh, 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 I just, apropos of nothing, just said, if you know a young person who wants to help the world and is worried about making a living, you might want to tell them to train as an electrician. And something like 10,000 people instantly retweeted it and started sending me all these notes about their cousin whose nephew who's going to be an electrician now and whatever. And it's absolutely right. That's where we're going. There from a very different perspective, the public transportation. Um, the the older I get, I mean, it, it's been pushed to me because now I, there's so many places I can't go. I really don't like to, to drive after dark. So many things I no longer can. And, and on the eastern side of the state, it's even worse because so much of the focus on public transportation has been put to Burlington and that whole area. There's no, there's no nighttime public transportation. I, I'm very, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I grew up in Philadelphia. I grew up in the cities, so it double feel, you know, I doubly feel like, why is this happening? And I just, and I don't hear anything really. I'm not talking about you guys, anything you but I don't hear anything from anybody, you know, on on looking at making that better. That's not that's not anybody's plate. You know, it, there's two issues. There's public transportation, and that's a real crisis, especially in a rural area. It's very tough, very expensive. That's the reality of what we face. We've got to keep doing all we can. Uh, but then there's what kind of transportation, whether it's public or private, we want to get fossil fuels out of that either way. But you're talking about a very significant problem uh, that has an independent challenge to us facing the climate crisis that we face. Uh, but I really appreciate what you're saying. And, and it's been a struggle for us in the state and at the federal level for a long time. Hi. This is a sort of nuts and bolts question for the two legislators. Thank you all for being here. My name is Rocket. I'm on the Hartford Select Board. And uh, it's an immense honor to serve here and represent my town. One of the issues I'm grappling with here listening to this is that the problem is obviously global. And when we talk about disempowerment of the youth, a sense of disempowerment, or disempowerment of people locally, and, and look at what we're dealing with here on the select board with inflation infected, affecting everyone, uh, reducing their purchasing power 9% this year. And um, the demographics maybe in this room are not representative of the demographics across our town. And we are trying to play our part by investing in green technologies and what's next, but it comes up against this very difficult reality of us being on a limited budget and us also maybe coming up against this idea that what cost do we ask our taxpayers or our citizens to, to carry and what will that net effect be on a global issue? So if you could maybe put yourself in my position and give me advice as to how we approach that both from the practical implementation level, but also from the narrative, how we present that and sell that story uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Well, Rocket, first of all, thanks uh, for your service. Um, and next to being on the school board, and my wife was the chair of a school board before she was in the legislature, I think serving in local politics, you can't run or hide, unlike Becca and I, you know. <laughs> Try to find us when we get out of here. <laughs> so a sincere thank you for your, for your work. Um, but what we need in all of this is a partnership and a commitment. You need the federal government to do what it does, okay? And what it can do is finance. It can provide policies. It can provide incentives. It can provide tax revenue to go into programs. Then you need more electricians. You know, you need folks uh, that are going to be on the front line of implementing but that they have a real promising career because there are policies out there that's going to make it possible for somebody in Hartford to say, you know what, we can get a heat pump. I know an electrician who can put it in. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But then, obviously, there's been an enormous amount of leadership in Vermont with these local energy committees. Linda Gray is here, and the work you've done, uh, yeah, you know, all of you have done has been so important in raising awareness. Uh, in getting people to talk to one another about what the things are that they can do in promoting that. So, you know, we're really all in this together. And the frustration that I run into, you know, young people 
like Becca was saying, are really discouraged that we're not doing anything. But we're starting to do things. But you know what? We can't let our cells become the victim of despair. We've got to decide. We wake up in the morning and we do what we can. Or we pull the covers over our head. And who said it was going to be easy? Honestly, who said it was going to be easy? So we've got now some momentum here. And you've got to find the way where you're at that you can make some progress and move forward. I mean, Bill McKibben has been at this with his incredible book in 1989. And he has been dealing with people like Ted Cruz and uh, <laughs> no, and other members of the great minds of the 18th and 17th century. <laughs> And he just keeps at it. I mean, whenever I got discouraged in Congress, I'd think McKibben. And I remember, <laughs> I'm not kidding. So, Rocket, hang in. So, in Rocket, this is essentially the work that we do as public officials and as leaders. We're constantly trying to balance, right, as you said, how, how do you make the pitch to residents, how do you make it meaningful for them and that this is a good use of the taxpayer dollars, right? And that is, um, that is, that is what it is to be a leader in your community, is how, trying to translate it. I want to take a minute to go back because I think it's related to your question, actually. What was your name again? Carl. Carl. We have ideas about who we are as Vermonters. Even if we don't think we do, we do. And we need to change some of that view of what it is to be a Vermonter. And so if people can't picture themselves as somebody who has solar panels or someone who drives an EV, even if it's affordable, sometimes it comes down to identity. That's not me. I don't do that. I don't do that kind of thing. I've heard that so many different ways in so many different communities and just fill in the blank, whatever it is. And I think we have an idea, too, about what it is to serve in a community. And you said the demographics in here, in this room, don't necessarily represent the demographics in your town. I just want to tell a quick story to try to illustrate this. A couple years ago, I was walking downtown in Brattleboro, and there was a man that I've known for years, um, an older gentleman, who had recently retired from, from a job at Landmark College. And he pulled me aside. He said, Becca, I'm very, very concerned about something, and I need you to like help me think about this. And he said, why don't the young people care? That was his question to me. Why don't the young people care? And I said, I, I don't see that from where I stand. So can you sort of take me through how you arrived at that? And he said, well, they're not serving on the select board and they're not serving on this committee and they're not doing that. And they, they didn't come out to this lecture at the library last night. And I said, <laughs> on a Wednesday night, and if they don't have childcare, they're, they're not going to go to the talk at the library, even if they really care about it. And many of them are working multiple jobs in this economy right now to pay down their student loan debts. And I said, I think you need to change your view of the people in your town and how they're engaging. And the next time I saw him, he said, you know what? You're right. The structures that we've set up for them to serve in these towns don't work for anyone who doesn't have you know, the day off during the day. Vermont is held together with duct tape and twine and hundreds of volunteer hours. Okay, That is how towns work right now. We have got to do the hard work in our communities and saying who we are as Vermonters, what that's going to look like 10, 15 years from now, can change. And we have to be the people who help people see possibility. And so I just didn't want to, to not acknowledge that because I think it's holding us back. I really do. Uh, so we have uh, time for one more question and Theo will figure out who. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this. <laughs> Um, I'm Kathy Newbury. I live in uh, Thetford, Vermont. Building on what Carl said, I have a question regarding how do we make 
solar energy more accessible to people who aren't middle class, who aren't upper middle class. We had a community share effort, um, a small so solar community share in Thetford, and I tried to get some neighbors to invest, and they said, we can't do that. We can't do that. And it isn't accessible to them in the, the current structures. I think we need a grant program. I think we need easy loans that go along with amortizing with what they normally pay for their electricity, for example. And then think about why is that important? Well, if you have solar panels or a tracker, you're much more likely to want an electric car because you have excess right. amounts. Right. If you don't, you see that as something other people have and I can't have, and then that can cause resentment. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, what is the electric company doing? Green Mountain Power is changing the incentives mm -hmm. for solar. And they're saying, we're using green energy. There's greenwashing because they say they're using but hydro power from Quebec. But the incentives are going down. Solar installers are leaving the, the state. And so what can be done to change that? It's a problem with the electric companies. And they say they're doing this because if they don't change that, that formula, they'll have to raise the rates for other people who don't have solar. So they're trying to divide us, those who don't have solar and those who do have solar. How about a program that says, what can we do to have more people have solar? Thank you. You know, you're talking about the very practical challenges that we face making the transition. Okay, so, and you've got entrepreneurs, you've got utility regulators. Vermont, by the way, uh, has been very fortunate that we didn't, uh, privatize the utilities and we have had uh, we've had regulated utilities that have largely been beneficial uh, much more so than what happened in Texas and other places where they sold out by the way uh, in all my wife Margaret is here where are you Margaret the, the person who can answer your question the best is over there <laughs> so you might want to <laughs> you might want to talk to her after but what <laughs> <laughs> no, but here, here's the thing. You're dealing with a concern that is at the heart of how we are going to get widespread acceptance and implementation. And it may be that in your case or someone else's solar works the best. Another may be heat pump. Another it may be Margaret and I did a lot of insulation in our house and it's really been beneficial for us. So my view is there's got to be flexibility. But the start of this is the public policies that provide incentives to help make it affordable. And then the implementation where, like our energy com committees are advocating for approaches that may work in the town. But there's always a fair question because one thing that can't be disregarded is we're trying to be practical to implement is looking at the bottom line cost of things. And you have to make decisions because there's not an infinite supply of incentives. So you, how much do we pay for, uh, and we as the taxpayers pay to have a subsidy for going from where we are to where we want to be, whether it be solar or geothermal, let's say. But those are practical questions that all of us have to be address and our political system has to address. The legislature could pass a bill increasing or decreasing incentives and favoring one kind of clean energy over another. But those are public things to be debated. But the engagement that you have, and people like Linda have had, has us in a community making those discussions and those trade-offs. But they're fair discussions, and they're really necessary. I'll just add that the place where you began the question was, I think, is really key. And it goes right to what Carl was saying before. So it's much cheaper over the life of your over your life to be using renewable energy but there's this upfront co I mean what we're doing is just substituting a system where you have to buy more energy every week with a system where you pay once to put up the thing and then the sun delivers your energy for free every day when it rises above the horizon that's clearly a better system in a million ways but there is this upfront problem so the way around it is is financing 
I mean, it's being able to treat, it's, it's like a mortgage. Like none of us could ever have afforded a house if there wasn't such a thing as a mortgage to let you do it, you know? And that's precisely where we are right now. And it's well within the ability of public policy to make that much easier. One of the saddest things that happened in, uh, in Washington this year was that um, the nomination of uh, a woman named Sarah Bloom Raskin to the Federal Reserve uh, was cut down by Joe Manchin uh, because her she Jamie Ra Congressman Jamie Raskin's wife would have brought to that role precisely this focus on making the financial industry a player in this work. But we've get this is a real job for Washington. And I hope you guys will push hard on the on the uh, financial regulatory system to make it do some of this because that's the and that's the. That's, that should be the easiest part of this. It all pencils out. It all makes complete financial sense, but you have to have the money to make it, you know, to allow you to do it in the first place. Well, we could certainly continue this for another hour, but uh, we're past 15 minutes or so past uh, the, the plan, but thank you all for coming. We really appreciate seeing you. We think this has been extraordinary and uh, each of our panelists are going to give a, a, a summary and I, I want to thank them. Uh, I want to thank them for being here. Uh, Vince is delighted to be able to host this, so thank you. So I'm going to keep it brief. I'm just to say it is really wonderful to see a packed house on an issue that is just so important to us in, who are in positions of, of power to make a difference. I'm certainly an incredible leader on this issue, but the real work happens out in communities. It really does. And so um, the other thing I want to say is to the VIN staff, I brought my kids here a lot when they were little, and it brought back a lot of memories to be here today thinking about um, just the incredible programming that happens here. And when we come out to a place like this, in a community like this, um, we are able to really treasure these places and bring it back to the issues that we're talking about here. We're talking about the land, we're talking about the air, we're talking about the flora and fauna. And this is what makes Vermont the incredibly special place that it is. And it's just an honor to be up here with these two men. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, you know, I, I was grateful when uh, Peter asked me to come because it's always fun to get to be with Peter and to be with Becca. But I, I was, I mean, the celebrities, and I got here early because the celebrities that I wanted to see were down in the cages. Um, <laughs> And I love the snowy owls, always sort of gives you that kind of side eye, you know, kind of thing. But today, today the, uh, the bald eagle was right out at the front of the cage, two inches away. So I sat and talked with him for a little while. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's been hard these last five or six years being the symbol of American, you know, America, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot to ask for uh, the eagle to have to put up with what we've, uh, you know, done to this country in recent times. So it was very, it's, this is a very, very hopeful occasion here today. We're getting ready to send remarkable people off to Washington. We're doing it at a moment. We're doing it at a moment when there's at least some sort of spring in our national step a little bit again. We've got an immense amount of work to do, an immense amount of fighting to do to make sure that things stay on the right track. But a day like today is a reminder of why we do this and how possible it is. So thanks to the two of you for being willing to leave behind uh, uh, the state of Vermont and head off to Washington. I'm not quite sure why you do it, but I'm glad you do. And it's very kind of you to go on our behalf. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill McKibben, for all your years of leadership. And 
And I got to tell you, I am so looking forward to working with Becca Ballant in Washington. And I want to look back at David Laughlin and thank you for your vision and your persistence and what you did and what you accomplished. And you know, Bill said he needed you know, to talk to the snowy owl. Uh, and uh, what we all need is the solidarity of the support of each other. The road is long. The road is bumpy. But everybody here has made a decision that it's, a worth, it's worth it to travel on that road to clean up our planet. And we can't do it alone. And we each have to do what we can. And it's what solidarity is about. And it's what's so difficult and has been so much under stress with COVID and all the things that have happened to us individually and our families. But coming together, asking these questions about the hard problems that are ahead, you know what? Life is about facing the problems, not denying them. And the whole pathway to solving the climate crisis is to understand that it's in taking on the challenge that we make ourselves better people, we make ourselves a cleaner planet, we make a safer place for our kids. And that's the choice we have, bumpy road as it may be. But it's so good to be here after having been pounding my head against the congressional wall uh, for all these years. And finally, to have the Inflation Reduction Act that really is meaningful in what it does in establishing federal policy and a commitment for us to face the climate change. And if all of us, every single one of us is so proud, and rightly so, of all the Vermonters who came before us. And whatever the politics were, whatever the debates were on taxes, there has been an ethic that we inherited and have an obligation to maintain of respect for the land that we live in. That's what is an identity, I think, Becca, that we Vermonters all share. So that's why it's so wonderful to be with all of you who are environmental leaders and have inspired us to do the work that we do. And thank you, Vins. Charlie Radigan, thank you so much. And the wonderful workers from Vins. We really appreciate it. Thank you one and all.